Hello, everyone, and welcome. The webinar will start promptly at 11. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on COVID in California. I'm Wendy Wirt, the incoming CWEA president and a civil engineer in the facilities planning department for the Los Angeles County Sanitation District. Today we are discuss the what agencies in California are doing based on the governor's mandate. So we're continuing operations and we're going to continue to support staff. We're going to do this by providing an overview of the virus, transmission, and operations and planning. Today's webinar will provide up-to-date information about the coronavirus, potential transmission of the disease through wastewater systems, disinfection standards to inactivate the virus, and planning for operations during a pandemic. WEF and CWEA want to provide members with verified information from nationally respected experts. Next slide. So just a bit about us, we're a regional agency that collects and treats sewage or wastewater from over 5.6 million people. That's over half the county's population. During this situation, we were also operating the district solid waste system, which provides for the solid waste management needs of about one fourth of the county. At the sanitation districts, we began early in February to monitor this situation and produce guidance documents for staff based on information from the CDC, such as protecting yourself and others from respiratory infections, and that was posted on February 12th. We started participating in situation meetings. We began to review and revise our leave, our travel, our visitor policies as well. So we felt like we were pretty on top of it. And of course, on March 19th, the governor issued the mandate for all individuals to stay at their place of resi residence to stop the spread of the novel coronavirus disease. And that was mandated, of course, until further notice. That same evening at 7.35 p.m., all Los Angeles County Sanitation District staff received a message from our chief engineer, Robert Ferrante. And that's the first time all employees received an evening message directly from our chief. Next slide. The county, of course, issued the closure of non-essential businesses. The sanitation districts is, of course, an essential business. And so we postponed our outreach events and we paused our internship program. But all staff who was scheduled to work did so. And so we encouraged employees who were capable of working from home to make arrangements to do so as quickly as possible. And I can't say enough good things, next slide please, about our IT department. The sanitation districts adopted the Microsoft Teams program back in January, and it was a lower priority collaboration tool. Now we couldn't all stay connected without it. We've been developing interesting, creative, and even fun solutions. Next slide, please. Our staff has been doing so much, adapting to these new conditions while knowing that we provide essential services to over 5 million people. Our purpose today is to help understand the virus so we can continue to protect staff as they're called to action and they continue protecting public health and the environment. I'd like to thank everyone for your dedication, and I know that we're going to get through this together. Next slide, please. This is just a disclaimer from CWEA. And then we'll go ahead at this point and continue with our moderator, Greg Kester. Greg is the Director of Renewable Resource Programs for CASA and the California Coordinator for Information about the Coronavirus in Wastewater. Greg is CASA's subject matter expert on emerging issues at the local, state, and federal level. Go ahead, Greg. Thank you very much, Wendy, and welcome, everyone. We're in uh, unprecedented and unique circumstances uh, for all of us, and uh, we're hoping you're all safe and faring as best as is possible uh, during these times. As with Ebola, we want to ensure safety for our workforce, especially those in collections 
and others who may be exposed to COVID-19 in wastewater prior to treatment. We have assembled experts for today's panel to discuss potential and real impacts of COVID-19 to the wastewater sector. We can't overstate our appreciation for them to take the time and address us today. And with that, uh, next slide. Just so you know, um, if you have a question about the Zoom technology, uh, please email this to Megan Barillo in the, or send it to her in the chat box. And if you have a question of uh, one of the speakers, please uh, list your question in the Q&A box, which is shown in the arrow uh, on the screen. Uh, we will not be using the raise hand option today, uh, simply because there are too many participants to make that uh, practical. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we have a couple of poll questions that we'll be uh, broadcasting throughout the webinar. Uh, this is the first one, uh, just asking what type of organization you work for. Um, if you could just uh, simply uh, respond to that would be of great assistance. So it just looks like from this poll question, we have a majority who uh, work with municipal and medium-sized uh, wastewater plants. Uh, and a fair number from large ones and a fair number from small ones as well. Thank you and with that we'll uh, get uh, started with our first speaker. I'd like to introduce Dr. Amy Kirby who's an environmental microbiologist in the waterborne disease prevention branch at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, CDC. Um, at CDC, Dr. Kirby studies antibiotic resistant bacteria in natural and man-made water systems. She uses a combination of traditional culture-based methods and advanced molecular methods to assess the prevalence and dynamics of anti-resistant bacteria and anti-resistant genes in drinking water, wastewater, and recreational water, such as oceans, lakes, and pools. She is currently deployed to the COVID-19 response as part of the Community Mitigation Task Force Water Sanitation and Hygiene Team. And with that, uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Uh, Dr. Kirby and let her begin. Thank you, Greg. Um, it is my pleasure to be here and talk to you all. So I am still seeing, let's see, close pulse, there we go. Okay. Great. So um, what I want to talk to you about today is a little background on the COVID-19 disease, um, what to look out for, some basic safety precautions that you can take, uh, and also talk a little bit about specific wastewater concerns and issues and how we're thinking about those at CDC and what we're doing to address those concerns. So a short overview of the presentation, as I said, we'll talk a little bit about COVID, um, what you should do. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about surface disinfection because that's really important, um, especially in the wastewater industry, um, as well as specific wastewater concerns. So the slides are no longer advancing for me. Monica, I don't know if you can advance them. There we go. Okay, so COVID-19 uh, was identified in Wuhan, China in December of 2019. Uh, the virus, so the disease is COVID-19. The virus that causes it uh, has been named SARS-CoV-2, coronavirus 2. It's closely related to uh, the original SARS virus, which circulated um, also in China about 20 years ago. Um, early on, there were reports that many of the patients had links to a large seafood and live animal market. Um, we now think that um, there may actually be cases that preceded that. Uh, and later patients didn't have exposure to the animal market. So we were seeing person-to-person -person spread uh, within China. And then Travel-related exportation of cases um, was reported shortly after that, uh, with the first U.S. case occurring in January uh, 21st of this year. 
Um, and then, uh, as you are all aware now, we have seen uh, person-to-person transmission and, and community transmission here in the United States. Um, we are reporting confirmed COVID cases online, um, and the link is available there uh, in this slide. Next slide. So the virus is thought to spread mainly from person to person. Um, so our primary concern is what we call respiratory droplet exposure. So if you think about when someone coughs or sneezes, the droplets that are produced um, from that, uh, so those travel about six feet before they are, before they fall to the ground under gravity, which is where that six feet um, social distancing guidance comes from. And you get exposed to the, to the droplets either because they, uh, you inhale them and they get into your nose or you breathe in through your mouth and they get into your mouth um, or they get on your hands or on surfaces and then with your hands you touch your face, touch your eyes, um, touch your mouth and you get a, a, what we call a mucous membrane exposure. So you can sort of think of those wet surfaces of your body um, as a mucous membrane exposure. Um, we do not I uh, think that there is airborne exposure. I realize that those terms are a bit confusing um, for the public, but airborne exposure to us indicates that it would travel much further. So good examples of that are measles and chicken pox, um, where you can get exposed. Um, it can hang in the air for a very long time, um, and we're not seeing evidence of that um, with coronavirus. Next slide. Symptoms to look out for, um, the really classic symptoms um, for COVID-19 are fever, and CDC defines that as a temperature of over 100.4. Uh, cough, especially a dry cough, um, so we're not seeing a lot of congestion associated with COVID-19, unlike a cold, um, and shortness of breath, um, because the com most common complication is pneumonia, so shortness of breath is really common. Um, there's been a huge range of illness severity reported. Uh, some, there's been some asymptomatic disease reported where people can be infected, but they don't have any symptoms. There can be very mild symptoms where you just sort of have a fever and, and feel run down for a few days before you recover. Um, but a substantial fraction of people have a severe illness. And of course, as we all know, it can result in death. Uh, and uh, some people, um, you are more prone to death if you have underlying issues or you're uh, immunocompromised. So we think about older people, um, people with transplants, with cancer, um, but we are seeing death even in people with no underlying disease. Uh, to the best of our knowledge, the estimated incubation period is two to 14 days. Um, so that's the time between when you're exposed to the virus um, and you start showing symptoms. So it can be very quickly, um, can be up to two weeks and that's where the two-week isolation uh, period comes from if you've been exposed, if you know you've been exposed, um, before you can go back out um, and have social contact. Complications of this, um, as I said, can include pneumonia um, that's quite severe. Um, that can lead to respiratory failure and then uh, multi-system organ failure. Uh, and hospitalizations are common, um, and they can last for quite a while. So we're seeing people in the hospital for several weeks. Next slide. So a little bit about what you can do um, to protect yourself and uh, your family and your coworkers. Um, we really think that everyday preventive actions are gonna be the key um, to uh, flattening the curve here. So you wanna avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth with uh, really hands regardless, but certainly unwashed hands. Um, again, those mucous membranes are where you're going to have uh, the potential for infection. Uh-oh. Uh, you want to avoid close contact with people who are sick. Um, we realize that may not always be possible if you're caring for someone in your house, and we have guidance for that online um, if you're in that situation. If you yourself are sick, um, please stay home. Even if you think it's allergies, we're going into allergy season here in Atlanta. Um, I'm assuming that some of you probably are too, um, or a cold or the flu. Um, please stay home and, and don't risk it. Uh, we encourage good respiratory hygiene, and so what that means is covering your cough or sneeze with a tissue and then throw it away. If you don't have a tissue available, coughing um, into your sleeve or your elbow um, so that you're not exposing other people and, and generating those respiratory droplets. We encourage cleaning and disinfecting of 
frequently touched objects and surfaces. So, you know, in your house, this would be like doorknobs, remote controls, countertops, um, toilet handle, those sorts of things. Um, and of course, wash your hands often with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. If soap and water isn't available, um, so you're out at a work site somewhere, use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer with at least 60% alcohol um, if soap and water are not available. And then in this little box over here, I should just note that there is currently no specific antiviral treatment available for COVID-19. So prevention is our key. Um, supportive care is really to relieve symptoms, to make you feel better, and try and manage these more severe complications of pneumonia and respiratory failure. Next slide. So again, what to do if you're sick? Um, stay at home. Mostly, most people can recover without needing medical care. Stay away from people, including your family, as much as possible. Um, keep your distance, cover your coughs, practice, practice good respiratory hygiene, um, clean your hands often, avoid sharing personal household items, so don't share your, you know, tablet or your phone um, or a remote control. Um, try and separate from the people that you uh, share your household with as much as possible. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects and surfaces. Um, if you have to share things, um, definitely target those. Um, and monitor your symptoms closely for the emergency warning signs that we would um, that would indicate you need medical care, especially trouble breathing. Um, and if that starts happening, don't wait. Um, do seek medical care. We do see that this ten, when people start having more severe symptoms, it goes very quickly. Um, so get medical care as soon as you start thinking that you might need it, but please call ahead um, so they will know that you are coming. And that applies whether you're going to an ER, your personal doctor, or an urgent care clinic. Um, they need to be able to plan for your arrival. If you are able to stay home um, and just ride it out at home, oh, I'm sorry, can, can you go back one more? Um, if you're able to stay home and you have not been tested, so without COVID test down at the bottom, you can get out of isolation um, when you've had no fever for 72 hours without any fever reducing meds. to stay in isolation for at least seven days. Um, and if you have had been tested, they'll require two negative tests in a row um, before you can uh, leave isolation. Next slide. So, so a few facts to know, um, some rumors we've seen out there. Um, diseases can make anyone sick regardless of their race or ethnicity. Um, certainly COVID meets that uh, criteria. Um, there's a lot more to learn about COVID. We are um, learning rapidly and updating our web pages uh, all the time. The website that's linked down there below is our general landing page for all um, COVID information at CDC. And from there, you'll find all kinds of useful information to you, including a symptom checker. If you think you might have COVID, um, but you're not sure, you can go in there and check off the symptoms that you have, um, and it will tell you whether or not that uh, sounds like COVID and whether or not you should, should seek uh, medical care. We do expect ongoing spread across the United States. Um, so we expect most of the U.S. population to become exposed at some point. Um, older adults and those with underlying medical conditions are at higher risk, as I said. Um, and the very best thing you can do to help slow the spread of uh, COVID is social distancing. So maintaining that six feet away, only doing essential services, um, and practicing good hand hygiene. Next slide. Yeah, so this is just a good um, slide for you to review. This will be available in the slide deck. So it has our link um, to our coronavirus page. It also has a link to our travel notice page. Um, we are not recommending travel at the moment, but that will eventually be released. Um, and that'll be a good place to look for that. Um, yeah, so we won't hang, uh, stay here long. Next slide, please. Okay, so specific things that you guys are interested in. Um, one of the things that should be really reassuring is that this virus is very sensitive to disinfection. So most common EPA registered disinfectants, we have household disinfectants on this slide, but disinfectants more generally, should be effective against this virus. It's an enveloped virus, which makes it more sensitive um, to disinfection in the environment, which is good news for us. 
Um, we know that disinfectants are in short supply, so we are also um, providing instruction on making bleach solutions. Um, we recommend between 0.1 and 0.5% um, bleach solutions, uh, which have been documented to be effective against viruses like COVID, or a 70% alcohol solution, um, both of which have been demonstrated to be highly effective. EPA is maintaining a list um, of approved disinfectants, so they have an emerging viral pathogens claim, so it's not going to be on the label, but they are approved um, for use against uh, SARS-CoV-2, and that list is being updated routinely as well, so I encourage you to check that out. Next slide. Okay, so wastewater, drinking water, and recreational water. Um, as I said, the virus is susceptible to disinfectants, so in general, we think that the risk um, of uh, it escaping a wastewater treatment plant or getting into municipal drinking water is very low um, because the treatment processes that happen within a wastewater treatment plant or within a drinking water drinking, drinking plant uh, should be highly effective. Uh, our recommendation for wastewater and sewage workers is to use their standard practices. So again, practice good respiratory and hand hygiene practice social distancing as much as possible both from your coworkers and from customers if you're out in the field um, and wear the PPE as prescribed for the current work task. Um, so that is going to be you know job and site specific um, what you might need. There is no evidence that we've seen in all of the epidemiology that wastewater workers are at a higher risk of infection. Um, and so we do not think that they need any additional protections in relation to COVID. Um, we do have a page linked there um, where we are um, constantly updating our wastewater and drinking water guidance. Um, so I encourage you to uh, you know, bookmark that page and come back and check it routinely as we continue to update that. <coughs> Next slide. One of the questions we've been asked a lot is whether we should be doing wastewater monitoring uh, for SARS-CoV-2. Um, there have been reports, and I think you will hear about some in just a minute, um, of SARS-CoV-2 viral RNA being detected in wastewater. Um, that is expected. We know it is shed in feces. Um, we expected it to show up in wastewater. Um, but at this time, we do not recommend widespread monitoring for this virus in wastewater. Um, and there's two reasons behind that. One, detecting it in sewage is not surprising, and knowing that would provide no actionable data for the utility. We wouldn't recommend you change anything about your PPE or about your treatment process if you had a positive detection um, of coronavirus. Also, um, the testing uh, capacity would put additional stress on the PPE and clinical testing supply chain. So at this moment in time, when those supply chains are so stressed, we want to think very, very carefully about the utility of any testing um, that we're doing. Um, and because there's no actionable data for the utility, we don't think this is something um, that utilities should um, pursue on a routine basis. And I believe that is my last slide. So I um, encourage you to check out the CDC website, uh, and I look forward to your questions at the end of the talk. Thank you very much, uh, Amy. And uh, just so the audience knows, we will have uh, questions and answers at the uh, end of the webinar. Uh, we're getting a lot of good questions already being submitted, and uh, please continue to do so. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Dr. Charles Gerba. He's a professor of epidemiology and biostatistics in the Department of Environmental Science at the University of Arizona. Uh, Dr. Gerba has an international reputation for his methodologies for pathogen detection in water and food, pathogen occurrences in households, and risk assessment. And with that, uh, happy to turn it over to uh, you, Chuck. actually is located adjacent to a wastewater treatment plant, just to give you a background. And uh, we've been collecting for almost a decade uh, samples of uh, wastewater before and after treatment uh, on a regular basis to look at several aspects of, of, of viruses in wastewater treatment. One is documenting the removal of viruses by treatment processes, particularly emerging pathogens uh, like the recent uh, 
uh, coronaviruses, but also changes in incidence of the virus as a community because they, they do increase or decrease uh, uh, depending on the incidence of a, a virus in, in the wastewater. And the other thing is we, we look at genomic analysis to see how these viruses might change over time. I, I think I wanna make it realize that viruses are always present in wastewater and the concentration, as I mentioned, varies with the incidence in the community. So you will find viruses uh, in raw wastewater almost all the time of hepatitis A, uh, rotaviruses and noroviruses, which cause diarrhea. So, uh, and there are also other viruses that cause respiratory diseases, almost always present in infectious form, uh, transmitted by aerosols such as the adenoviruses. So, uh, just to be aware uh, that there are always uh, potentially pathogenic disease causing organisms uh, within wastewater. Now, coronavirus is excreted in the feces. Uh, in addition to respiratory droplets uh, being uh, a major source of environmental contamination, feces contamination has been documented, but the data is very limited on this new coronavirus. The question really has, has come up, is it, uh, is it stay infectious very long in the environment? One report of it, infectious virus being isolated from feces and other attempts have not done it yet. So the amount of information uh, is very limited on whether even this virus uh, is infection, but an infected person may excrete this virus uh, for at least a couple of weeks it's been found. Whether that virus is infectious, again, is really not known. Previously, because of the original SARS outbreak, we studied the survival of two different coronaviruses in sewage, and we found survival was about two or three days, and recent data on, on the new coronavirus has also shown that it probably may survive two or three days and survive on surfaces, at least for several hours to maybe a couple of days, depending on environmental conditions in that. But again, the main route to, that's believed to be transmission of this is by droplets. So a lot of the other stuff is open to question whether it can be transmitted by that route. Uh, and, and we're waiting for epidemiological data uh, I, I think to back that up. Now, several groups, uh, four that I'm aware, of, have documented the occurrence of the new coronavirus in raw sewage by molecular methods. However, it's important to recognize these molecular methods do not tell you whether the virus is infective or not. It just tells you that it's, pre it's present. Um, our, our, our group uh, also looked at the primary solids and uh, wastewater leaving the plant after treatment, receiving a barden faux processes. And uh, one, the virus does tend to uh, stick to solids. That's been found in previous work with viruses with similar structure. They tend, this type of virus has a lipid, it tends to uh, be attracted to solids. We did not find any uh, of the uh, COVID-19 virus in, in treated wastewater. So we're, uh, just gives us more confidence that this virus is easily removed uh, by normal treatment processes. Um, now, methodology, again, is detected, is limited for the detection of this virus is being rapidly developed. Uh, our group is primarily focusing on developing methods for quantifying the virus and coming up with methods so we can accurately determine uh, the concentrations that may be in the water and that that's still really under development now. Another reason why not uh, it's not probably necessary to, to really process a lot of samples right now for the virus because the methods are just evolving uh, as we speak. Um, now, what about protection in that? The concern too is this virus, as I mentioned, can survive on surfaces uh, for at least several hours, if not days, depending on environmental conditions. But as was previously said, normal disinfection, this virus is very sensitive to, fortunately. Now for protective uh, gear, uh, protective personal equipment, uh, it, it's felt that the current guidelines are more than adequate to protect against that, this virus. Now, there was a paper published last year in 2019 with Mark Le Chevalier as the major author, author published in Water Environment uh, Research. And in it is a, an assessment of what type of equipment would be needed for different exposures at uh, wastewater treatment <coughs> plants or in dealing with uh, maintenance of uh, wastewater uh, sewer lines and that that might be necessary. It basically gives an assessment 
So what type of equipment would be uh, required for different types of operations in the wastewater industry? And I kind of recommend you look at that. The recommendations go from anywhere from just using durable gloves to actually using N95 masks or face masks. Um, only a few incidences is that actually recommended, but I think it's worth reviewing this assessment because it was an assessment by industry representatives, uh, public health people, to see what type of protection equipment would be recommended for different operations and area uh, of work uh, around wastewater treatment plants. And I, I think it, it provides some really decent guidance uh, for what you might want to consider uh, when you're recommending protective equipment or what you should have available or what you should be doing in, in different exposure scenarios. The big concern always is the production of droplets uh, and uh, entrance into sewer systems. And, and this gives recommendations on uh, what type of protective equipment should be utilized in those different situations. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. And with that, uh, let's go on to our, our third speaker, Dr. Rasha Malbard. Uh, as a senior microbiologist, um, it looks sounds like somebody may not be on mute that should be. Um, but anyway, uh, Dr. Uh, Malbard is a senior microbiologist at EPCOR Water Services Incorporated. He runs both the drinking water and wastewater microbiology labs and conducts research related to optimization of water monitoring, treatment, and distribution. Uh, she currently uh, serves as the chair of WEF's Waterborne Infectious Disease Outbreak Control Subcommittee. Um, and she's an environmental microbiologist whose work focuses on protecting public health by understanding the waterborne pathogen ecology, survival and transmission in both natural and engineered environments. And with that, uh, please uh, go ahead, Dr. Malbard. Thank you very much, Greg. So as some of you may know, WEF had published a guide to COVID-19 virus back in February that was, um, that was basically written by a small working group um, that, sorry, I'm having trouble forwarding my presentation. There we go. So what I would like to do, it's only been seven weeks since we actually published this Water Professionals Guide. But in those seven weeks, as you can imagine, a lot of science has been produced. And as Dr. Gerber and Dr. Kirby have pointed out, uh, that science keeps on coming. So we thought it would be very important for us to give you a bit of an update on what we're thinking right now at the working group and uh, what we will be publishing very soon. So you'll get a sneak peek of the next update. So the original web page uh, that was published was authored by the Waterborne Infectious Disease Outbreak Control Working Group. We're a small um, group that's part of the WEF Disinfection and Public Health Committee, and that involves a variety of utility, academic, government representatives, uh, so that we could get a full perspective. We also were very lucky in that we had supporting members, people like Dr. Uh, Charles um, Gerba, who you've just heard, who were willing to participate and to give us some feedback on some of the recommendations we had made. The data we used was synthesized from uh, a literature review. We looked at everything we had in front of us and we came up with a variety of recommendations. So the recommendations were pretty much based on scientific literature at that point. We did an internal review uh, by WEF and then an external review where EPA, CDC, and, um, and some other organizations gave us some feedback. Uh, but at the end of the day, we basically produced something that went live on February 19th. So what you're seeing right now here is the Water Professionals Guide to COVID. This is what's on the WEF website and this involves um, all the literature that we've cited as well as the recommendations that we made for utilities and water professionals. We, um, to come up with this though, to give you a little bit of background, uh, can we move to the next slide, Monica? So to come up with this at the time, by the amount of knowledge we had on COVID-19 virus. 
So recently we looked at the data and we decided that it was somewhat important for us to come up with an update uh, that involves one a summary of the newest scientific developments. Um, we wanted that literature as well to reflect the variety of information out there, but we wanted to encourage water professionals to take a step back and start working on their COVID virus literacy. So as you noticed today from Dr. Haas's presentation and Dr. Kirby's presentation, there is RNA research being done. There's also infectivity um, research being done. And those are very different things. So we'll talk about those a little bit today and in the update. We wanted to reiterate that our recommendations to utilities have not changed and they do align with the CDC and the World Health Organization. And we wanted to bring up the fact that there, there may be gaps that are being brought up right now, but those will be addressed as we go um, through WEF and various processes at WEF. At the end of the presentation, Claudio perhaps will be able to talk to these today. Next slide, please. So the basis for our recommendation came from the CDC hierarchy of resistance and susceptibility to disinfection. I think most people at this point have seen this um, graph here, this, this image of the organisms with prions being at the top, being the most resistant to environmental conditions and disinfection. And then you've got the enveloped viruses right at the bottom. And, uh, and so the, I think we're gonna have to keep asking Monica to forward this for us. Thank you, Monica. So we are lucky in that, oh no, <laughs> gone too far. Unfortunately, I use a lot of animation, so I will probably pay the price for this today. Can we, can we go back, Monica? Sorry about that. So, okay, let's stay right here. So we're lucky in that COVID-19 virus is an enveloped virus. So it's actually amongst the most susceptible organisms we know of. The literature supports this. The literature also tells us that while COVID-19 virus is closely related to the SARS coronavirus, it is a new virus. So there are some similarities in biology and biochemical properties, but there might also be some differences. Next slide, please, Monica. One more click. So what we've known about other coronaviruses has very much come from the human coronavirus literature, so SARS specifically during the 2002 and 2003 outbreak, and some of the other human coronaviruses, um, like the cold viruses that many of us are familiar with. Uh, so uh, Dr. Gerba's study with, uh, with Patricia Gundy from 2009 is a very quoted study. Uh, so is the Wang study on SARS coronavirus from 2005. The other studies come from the animal literature. So um, if you've heard of the Casanova and Sopsi study that has been uh, used for the World Health Organization recommendations, um, those relied on some of the animal coronaviruses. Now, that more recently, there's been various authors who've taken all the literature available and created what we call meta-analyses. Those are studies where you take all of the different studies and you come up with recommendations based on a synthesis of everything available. So this study by Camfetal was very much quoted uh, by various guidances because it was able to look at 22 different studies looking at coronaviruses. And it made recommendations as to disinfection and efficacy of disinfection. Uh, next slide, please, Monica. And then there's a whole variety of other non-enveloped viruses that we've been studying for years. So as part of the Dr. Gerba study, Gandhi et al. 2009, they did look at polio, they looked at coliphages, they also looked at the fecal indicator bacterium, E. coli at the time. But if you look through the literature, we do have quite a bit of work that has been done on the enteric viruses, norovirus, adenovirus, and so on. So that has been a very um, good source for us to base our recommendations on. Next slide, please, Monica. So COVID-19 virus has had quite a bit of evolution in the knowledge on it, right? So we've known for a while now that there has been multiple shedding routes for it. So it's present in saliva and respiratory secretions in blood. When it came to feces, aerosols, and formites, though, there seems to be some contradictory data. So 
This is based on the fact that some people are doing RNA-based research while other people are trying to look at infectivity through cell culture-based research. And so the results can be different because those methods are very different. There, at that point in time, when we released our guidance, there was actually no evidence of uh, COVID-19 having been detected in sewage. But we knew back then even that that was just temporary, that it was just a matter of time before someone was going to find it if you have enough cases in the community. Next slide, please. So let's do a bit of a summary on what new information is available out there. First of all, COVID-19 virus has been uh, detected in wastewater. But before you get very excited about that, as Dr. Gerba said, RNA has been detected in wastewater. So what that actually means is that data was um, able to tell us that the virus is present, but we didn't know whether it's infective or not, because RNA data doesn't tell you very much about that. What the data was meant for, though, in the Netherlands was uh, they were looking at this data as a public health tool to understand what the number of cases in the community actually is and whether or not there is a risk to wastewater workers. So it is a very, very important study in the sense that it starts kind of contextualizing that, yes, we can find this COVID virus in sewage. Similar efforts, as you heard today from, from uh, Dr. Kirby, are being um, conducted by the Water Research uh, foundation in Australia and potentially the CDC, Dr. Gerba as well, of course. There's been other work done recently. So Chinatel just published something two days ago on the viability in the environment. So this is a study, um, again, Dr. Gerba referred to it, where we were able to see that COVID-19 virus can actually survive more than 14 days in transport medium at four degrees. So transport medium is um, a medium we use in the lab to um, to grow viruses, to keep them happy. It is a very virus-friendly medium. But what the same study said very clearly was that this, this, um, this virus is also very susceptible to standard disinfection methods. This is a preprint on MET archives. Perhaps um, we should wait to really issue our, our uh, opinion on it until the methods are released a little bit more. Then, of course, there's been the study by uh, Van, uh, Van Mal and et al. from NIH, and they looked at the aerosolization um, and the viability on fomites of COVID virus. Now, they did find that in aerosols and on fomites, SARS uh, coronavirus 2, which is actually the novel coronavirus, behaves a lot like the original SARS virus. And so, yes, it can potentially survive. But I'd like to remind you again that this, much like the Chin Natal study, was based on experimental conditions. There was one more study that came, of course, from, from uh, um, the clinical literature where uh, a group of researchers looked at the air samples and fomite samples uh, in three positive patients' rooms. Again, they were able to detect the RNA. They were not able to detect the RNA in aerosols, but they were on fomites and on PPE, in this case, boot covers. Again, reminder, this is RNA in this particular case. So this is where I go back to the idea of scientific literacy. One thing we as water professionals are gonna have to be very careful about is how we understand viruses. So when we talk about viruses, they are not cells. We do not consider themselves in the sense that they can't replicate without a host cell. They're packaged molecular material. So if we were to take the COVID uh, virus as an example right here, so um, that is the virus. The red spikes in it are the S protein, which allows it to attach to the receptors on the host cells. So these ACE2 receptors at the bottom on that surface are actually what they have to attach to, enable, uh, to be able to enter that cell. If that spike protein wasn't there, then cell invasion would be extremely unlikely. So the methods we've seen today are either based on RNA or on culture. So when you have an RNA sample, basically what we need to do is we take that wastewater sample, we concentrate it, we add reagents to pop open the virus, the outside envelope, and then basically add more reagents to clean up the enzymes that could degrade the RNA. Once we have that, we create the right conditions 
with reagents, chemicals, and temperature, and we add fluorescent dyes so that what would happen is when we're looking at the, the virus, we're not actually looking at the virus, we're looking at the RNA, um, and the more RNA you have, the more fluorescence you have. So this image on the left here is from the World Health Organization uh, reverse transcriptase PCR protocol for the N gene specifically. But so, again, you have basically been looking for the genetic material, not the actual organism. If you look on the right here, when it comes to cell culture, you're starting to basically take a sample, your wastewater, you clean it up, you pre-treat it potentially, but then you add it to a, a lawn, a, a culture of cells that are appropriate host cells. So what you should see is, you should see that these cells are basically starting to lyse or rupture when the viruses are able to get inside them and you use them as host cells. So what you're seeing on the right here, that top image is what the cell culture looks like, the host cells, before you add the virus. And this on the bottom is what you see when the virus starts really degrading that host cell. So as you can imagine then, when you're looking at the environmental stress impacts on COVID-19 virus or any other virus, you basically can see different types of impacts. So if you're looking at the top image here and the impacts of irradiation, irradiation will uh, impact or destroy the nucleic acids, the molecular material itself. So what you would have is the RNA is destroyed, but the spike protein could be intact in that case. But then if you're looking for RNA, you're not going to find it. And really, you're not very likely to get a positive cell culture. If you're looking at disinfection practice as well, disinfection can result in different impacts. So in one case, you have the RNA intact, but the spike protein destroyed. So in that case, you will find the RNA, but your cell culture would be negative. RNA intact and whole envelope destroyed is somewhat similar in that obviously there's no way for the cell to, to for the virus to enter the host cell. So again, you would potentially find the RNA test positive, but the cell culture negative. And then finally, if you're in a situation where your virus has been stressed enough for the RNA and the, the, the envelope to be destroyed, then you probably wouldn't find anything. So going back to Dr. Gerber's comment, we're really um, at the frontiers of this new science and we don't know how to isolate the virus very well or how to quantify it, which is why we rely on people like Dr. Gerber to do the work he does so that we can get some quantifiable numbers um, and go from there. There's a variety of hypothetical risk papers that are out there now. And uh, this one is a good example, just came out this morning. It's by Michael Gomley et al. And it was looking at the, the SARS uh, outbreak back in 2003 and comparing it to what would happen if with COVID, they make a variety of recommendations. As a water professional, we can read these, and yes, we can absolutely take these precautionary measures, but we need to understand when there's actually no evidence yet to suggest that this is the case. So our recommendations stand. What we have on the WEF website right now is still the same, and it's not going to be changed uh, based on the current knowledge. We are still encouraging people to not panic and stay informed, communicate why they're making the decisions they're making, and wear their PPE and practice good hygiene. Those things are constants. We want you to work on your scientific literacy. We want you to understand the difference between RNA work and infective cell culture work. From a process point of view, it's business as usual. We've disinfected far more resistant viruses, the non-enveloped, and so we know our practices work. We continue to monitor our plant performance and we continue to monitor our supply chain. Then finally, uh, on the plant side of things, we need to take a look at our administrative and engineering controls and put the right plans into place. But as you can imagine, really, at the end of the day, WEF will look at the research and at the policy gaps and propose various things that can be done uh, to protect our workers, to protect the environment, and to protect public health better. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rasha. And now on to our, our final speaker. Pleasure to introduce Eileen White, uh, currently the Director of Wastewater for the East Bay Municipal Utility District in Oakland. 
uh, which supplies water to approximately 1.4 million people and wastewater services to almost 700,000 people. Eileen has more than 20 years of engineering experience in the wastewater, water and power industries. As the director of wastewater, she's responsible for leading the wastewater department, which includes planning, organizing, and leading the engineering operation and maintenance of the wastewater system to ensure efficient operations that meet all regulations. Uh, with that, uh, welcome Eileen. Thank you, Greg. Hello, everyone. I'm honored to be a speaker here today, and I'm gonna provide one utility's perspective on our response to the coronavirus. Um, let me see if I can advance this. I don't have control of the screen right now. Oh, here we go. Okay, let me back up. Great. So the photo here shows the Grand Princess cruise ship, which has now become probably the second most famous cruise ship in the world after the Titanic. And some of you may be wondering why is Eileen showing this as her opening slide? Well, that's because the Princess cruise ship came and was docked in Oakland right next to East Bay's Muds facilities at the foot of the Bay Bridge. And I'm going to explain in a moment our interactions with the cruise ship. But first, I want to begin with East Bay Mud. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, we're located in Northern California, and on the right is our service area. The photo on the left shows our main plant located in West Oakland. The star marks the spot where the Grand Princess cruise ship was docked just about a mile away. We have one wastewater treatment plant. We provide wastewater service to about 700,000 customers. We have about 2,000 employees total and about 270 wastewater employees. In today's presentation, I wanna talk about the Grand Princess cruise ship, talk about our continuity of operations and emergency personnel, and talk about our next steps from the perspective of a large water wastewater utility. So first, you think back, today's April 1st. February already seems like a lifetime ago. The Grand Princess cruise ship left San Francisco on February 11th and traveled to Mexico and returned back on February 21st. The ship had a quick turnaround that day and left on a second voyage to Hawaii with 62 passengers on the first cruise. 10 days later from the cruise, people began showing symptoms of COVID-19. On March 2nd, a resident of Sonoma County in Northern California tested positive. Two days after, an elderly man with pre-existing health conditions in Placer County passed away. In response, the officials ordered the ship that they had to return back to the mainland for quarantine. After several days just waiting outside the Golden Gate, the Grand Princess cruise ship docked at the Port of Oakland on March 9th with little notice. When they arrived at the Port of Oakland, they were full of waste and at maximum capacity. On March 10th, they called us and wanted to start discharging waste immediately. And I said we had to hold off for a bit. We worked very closely with them to treat the water, but before we could treat, we needed to make sure we informed our staff. We all know that wastewater is full of viruses, but because of the heightened perceived anxiety about the coronavirus, I met with the unions and I met with the staff and I provided a notice to all our wastewater staff to let them know that we would be taking the waste from the Princess cruise ship. They asked to initially discharge 400,000 gallons and we agreed and issued the discharge permit. But as I speak right now, although they're no longer docked in the Port of Oakland, they're continuing to discharge to our wastewater system. And I'll explain how it works. So basically what they did, when they came into port, it took us about 18 hours to get the paperwork on what was in their waste and to figure out how we were gonna discharge it. So how it works is the cruise ship now, if you look out in San Francisco, you can see it from Oakland, it's just out there in the water. And what it does is they go ahead and discharge their waste into tanks on a barge and then the barge brings it in, and it, then it, we add sodium hypochloride before entering the sewer system, and then it travels to our main wastewater treatment plant, where it undergoes primary and secondary treatment and disinfection before being discharged into San Francisco Bay. We've set it up so that the total flow from the Princess cruise ship is only about 1% of the flow on any given day to the plant. 
So, so far we've been very successful. I do want to say the Princess Cruise Ship staff have been excellent to work with and they really want to do the right thing. And they, at this point, do not know when they will be leaving and how much longer they will need to discharge the waste to our wastewater. So I think we've all seen maps like on the news showing the number of COVID-19 cases. And with the few first few infections starting appearing in the Bay Area, I don't think we could have ever imagined where we are today and what it's done to our normal way of life. I'm having trouble advancing. Can I get the next slide? So East Bay Mud did, does have, uh, which we've had for over a decade, a communicable disease response plan. And basically there's four different levels. And for the last several decades, we've really been in level one, no impact. Level two is when there's a general impact to the service area. And we declare that on March 9th. Level three is a moderate impact to the district. This is really different than when we've had earthquakes and other disasters because we weren't immediately impacted. But we declared a moderate impact on March 16th. And only two days later, we declared severe impact level four on March 18th. Now I have to admit, we have a lot of emergency response plans, but we've never actually used our communicable disease response plan before. So I have to say this is really a learning opportunity and we're gonna be able to, at the end of this whole incident, be able to improve now that we were actually living through it. So next slide, please. So as part of our response to the coronavirus, there's three different response types. There's what we're doing with our community, there's what we're doing with our employees, and then there's our continuous operation. Next slide, please. Well, with the community, we provide water to 1.4 million customers and wastewater service to about 700,000 customers. And as we all know, the key, as you heard earlier today, is washing your hands with soap and water. So we have suspended all water shutoffs and we've restored service to all customers who have not paid their bills. So at this point in time, water service is restored to everybody. We're issuing payment plan extensions and we're waiving late fees. And as I speak, the phones have been ringing off the hook for the last several weeks of customers who can no longer pay their bill. And that's, I'll talk about later, an unattended consequence of this event. The next slide talks about what we're doing for our employees. We very quickly, we have not been an organization that has had a lot of telecommunication. It's been very isolated. But very quickly, in the last few weeks, we have got everybody who can set up to telecommute. Over half our workforce is now telecommuting from home. And it's remarkable because if you had asked anybody six months ago, there was less than 50 people telecommuting. Now we have about a thousand employees. For those who do have to come to work, we've secured additional parking so they can park in our main building. We're also increasing our cleaning procedures. And in our admin building, where I'm sitting right now, it only has about 700 employees. I think there's less than 100 employees today. And as of last Friday, we had one employee test positive for the coronavirus. So fortunately, we had executed on our telecommuting plan two weeks prior. In order to improve social distancing at our main wastewater treatment plant, where there's normally several operators in the control room, we have rented trailers, as you can see in the far right photo, and we put in portable tables set up six feet apart. And they have now, since these photos have been taken, have been hooked up with computers and monitoring screens so we can spread out our operators as they monitor the operations of the main wastewater treatment plant. And the next slide talks about what we're doing with our employees. We are telling all employees to encourage them and telling them. We have been directing staff to stay home if they come to work sick. We've had a couple of people who've been on cruise ship. In fact, I had a, one of my employees who was on that Princess cruise ship when it went off to Mexico and came back. Fortunately, he self-quarantined. We are ordering anyone who's been on cruises, they had must self-quarantine for 14 days before coming to work. Anybody who exhibits signs of the coronavirus, 
must get a doctor's note to be cleared to be come back to work. In order to work with our employees, we have advanced 80 hours of sick leave. So if you run out of sick leave, we will give you an advancement of 80 hours. We are doing everything we can to encourage our employees to not come to work while they are sick. We want to protect the safety of our employees. The next slide talks about our continuous operations that we're doing. There are some people who don't get to telecommute and we have maintenance issues. We had an issue with our gas pipe yesterday. We need our maintenance staff to respond when the pipe breaks. Other critical functions is our lab. The district has a wonderful lab with dedicated staff who provide the analytical analysis for both the water system and the wastewater system. Where we can, we've let supervisors and client managers telecommute. We've let some lab staff telecommute part-time that they can do some paperwork at home. But as you know, an anal analysis takes a lab staff person to do it. So that is, they have very limited telecommuting opportunities. But to help encourage the social distancing, we're letting people stagger their hours. We're letting people change their work days off. If they want to exchange their work days and come in and work Saturday and Sunday, which works well for a lot of people who are now caring for their own school-age kids at home, it's a win-win for everybody. It lets them maybe come in on Saturday and Sunday while their spouse is working other days of the week. And then it's also allowing more social distancing. And then of course, we've reduced any field activities that are non-essential work at this time. And then continue on to the next slide on our continuous operations. Other groups that cannot telecommute include our operations. And so what we've done, where we can, we've allowed two week rotations of essential staff. Some businesses, it's only a week, some it's shorter. But wherever we can, we're trying to make sure for critical staff that we keep them healthy. So for some of our water treatment operators, we're only operating two plants now versus the peak summer where we may be operating four or five plants. We've sent them home on two week rotations. For some of our maintenance staff, who were, weren't focused on critical work that had to be done, it wasn't corrective work, we've sent some of them home, our electricians, instrument techs, and maintenance machinists, so they can stay healthy. So if one of them gets sick, that the whole crew does not get sick. Also, to protect worker safety, we've started work hours of our maintenance staff. We have some starting at six, some at seven, some at eight. So in the, they're in the locker rooms at different times, they're taking their breaks at different times and different lunch, lunch hours. The other thing we're doing is we're monitoring the supply chains and we're communicating with our vendors. Fortunately, with the exception of disinfectant wipes, we've been able to get all our deliveries for chemicals and key things we need. The biggest shortage, as we all know, is the N95 masks and disinfectant wipes. Next slide talks about some of our contingency planning we're doing. Like a lot of utilities throughout the state, when people retire from the district, they're not allowed to come back and work as employees. Well, last Tuesday at our board meeting, our board revised their emergency preparedness policy so that we can bring back retirees on a voluntary basis in times of crisis. So for critical positions like our wastewater operators, we have a list of wastewater operators that retired in the last couple years, and we check them on the, on the state's website that they have current licenses, and we're now reaching out who would like to come back and help us operate if we end up getting a big outbreak of the coronavirus with our staff. We're also working with our team to come up with solutions. I find some of the best solutions come from our own lab staff, our maintenance workers, and our operations staff. One of the out-of-the-box alternatives is if we run into issues with biosolids, solid we are evaluating the possibility of renting shipping containers from our neighbors to store biosolids on site. And this crisis that we've never experienced before, I tell my team, no idea is a bad idea, and every idea is a good idea for us to explore. The next slide talks about how we can turn these challenges into opportunities. This pandemic continues to throw us new challenges each day, from the first shelter-in-place order to the second shelter-in-place order, 
to the one that was extended last night. And each time we need to come together and figure out how do we interpret it? What construction work is still critical? What work must still go on? But this is an opportunity for us to also shine. From a positive, we've seen how staff have risen to the occasion and have really embraced telecommuting and having their meetings online and through webinars. The next slide kind of talks about how we need to take it one step at a time. We don't know what the next week, two weeks, three weeks, or month or two months holds. We haven't done everything perfect, I'm gonna to have to admit. We could have done better communication early on, but we're improving each day. We're listening to our teams. We're meeting with the unions. I think for the last two weeks, I've met with all the unions every day. We share ideas, we brainstorm together, and we come up with good problem solving and good solutions. So nothing's perfect, but we've all agreed we need to be flexible. We'll try some things, they may not work. We'll learn from those, move on, and keep dealing with the crisis. On the next slide, I talk about how not only do we rely on our own internal team, but how we also want to stay in communication with the other agencies in the Bay Area. We've been communicating with the other 37 POTWs in the Bay Area. We have a conference call at one o'clock today. We want to discuss how we're all going to interpret the new extended shelter in place order, how we're dealing with the various federal lead, how we're dealing with staffing our plants. And we're also coordinating with the local water agencies, compiling information, and also sharing information. We're here to help serve each other. So as I've said to some of the other utilities, we have a large lab. If some lab runs into problems, if we've got capacity, we're here to help. Likewise, people have explored the option of bringing back retirees that maybe have expired license. If we can offer a licensed wastewater operator, we can offer that to another utility, even though the retiree with the expired license might be better equipped to actually operate the plant. I think this is a time for us all to come together and work together and rise to these challenges and, and be able to continue to protect our workers and to protect public health. The next slide talks about our next steps. And in the short term, our number one goal is to protect our employees and protect public health and to protect the environment. And as we've heard earlier today from the other speakers, we continue to remind our wastewater operators, follow all the training you have been given. You wear your same PPEs and this virus is like any other viruses that are in the wastewater as you heard earlier today. And so far, things have been actually going very well. We know we're expecting a big increase in coronavirus cases in the next couple of weeks. So we're taking each day as it comes, making sure we're protecting our employees, public health, and the environment. The next slide talks about some of the more long-term challenges. On the long-term, we know that there's gonna be financial impacts. With the various shelter-in-place orders put into place, we've seen our commercial paper debt, the short-term debt interest rates rise significantly in a matter of a few days. We also know that we're gonna have lost water and wastewater revenue. The phones are ringing off the hook. People cannot pay their bills. And that's only gonna worsen as a shelter-in-place continues. So long term, there's going to be financial impacts. We still don't know the impacts to the economy. Are we facing the biggest economic crisis since the 1930s? Only time will tell. We just need to work through each of the issues. But right now, we're focused on the short term, protecting employees and public health. We're in the response mode. When we get into the recovery mode, we'll be addressing the financial impacts. And then when we get into the mitigations, we're gonna take all the lessons learned so we're better prepared for the next pandemic. And it may not even be that far away. Knowing that there's not a vaccine, we need to be prepared that if we do come out of this by July or August, that we could be back into another pandemic in the fall. The next slide talks about even a worse case scenario. What if we have another disaster on top of this? For those of you in California, you'll remember last October and November, 
the threat of wildfires led to the first ever public safety power shutoffs that lasted 23 days and affected 3 million people at its worst. We lost power for three different occasions to a number of our facilities in the water system. And on top of that, we could have an earthquake. So we could even be in worse conditions in the fall if this pandemic comes back and if we get an earthquake or we're in the public safety power shutoffs. So we must continue to prepare as we work through this disaster and learn what we can to be better prepared in the future. The next slide talk, reminds us what happened in the fall of 1989. We had the 6.9 magnitude Loma created earthquake that rocked the Bay Area during the World Series match between the A's and San Francisco Giants. Well, now there's a 72% probability of a 6.7 magnitude or greater in the Bay Area in the next 30 years. Hopefully, it doesn't occur while we're in a pandemic. We've got enough on our plates right now, but we need to think about that as we plan for the future. And the next slide talks about, as we learn to improve our pandemic plan after this is all over, we're gonna be better resilient. And that resiliency is gonna apply as we prepare for climate change and prepare to respond to sea level rise, storm surges, drought, atmospheric rivers, and flooding. It's hard to believe that at the end of February, what was beginning to be everyone's biggest concern was not the coronavirus, but the potential drought in California, as we had the driest February on record. How quickly things change for the better for our water supply, as we got some good storms in the Sierras in early March. The drought word no longer exists, but now it's the pandemic. The next slide talks about what is the key to getting through all these disasters. And the big key is collaboration. What we're doing today, sharing information, the scientists, the universities, the water agencies, the wastewater agencies, the regulators. And for us, we're not only collaborating with the other POTWs in the Bay Area, the water agencies, we're also collaborating with Stanford University and a private company out of Boston that's partnering with MIT, Harvard, and Brimming and Women's Hospital to better understand the coronavirus and sewage. Our goal is to work collaboratively with them to develop a predictive tool for the medical community. I've talked to some of the largest uh, healthcare providers in Northern California, and they're looking forward to seeing the results. It could be very helpful as we're short tests for people of the coronavirus, but if we can better understand the presence of it in the community as we go up the curve, down the curve, and then as we get into the fall, it can be a very useful public health tool if we start seeing it increasing in the sewage. So we're hopeful that we can use our sewage as a useful tool to help the medical community. And it really hit home yesterday evening when I got an email from one of my employees at seven o'clock last night saying he wasn't coming to work today. He's been out for several days sick. He coordinated it with his doctor and sent me his doctor's note. He's got all the symptoms of coronavirus, and the doctor said, we don't want to test you. We're short on tests. Stay home. If you have breathing problems, come to the ER. So if we can better prepare the medical community by using our sewage, we're looking forward to that opportunity. On to the next slide. And finally, I kind of want to take an opportunity to remind everybody out there, to remind your friends and family to flush only the three P's down the toilet. P, who, and toilet paper. I know that toilet paper is scarce these days, but the wipes are not flushable. We must make sure that we don't make matters worse now for our wastewater workers who already have plenty on their plate. And finally, I'd like to conclude with this last slide. This photo is a historical photo from our archives showing our mass employees in our head office during the 1918 flu epidemic. They got through it then, and we will get through it now. We need to stay positive and to continue to collaborate as we manage through these challenging times. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share East Bay Mud's experience today. Thank you very much, Eileen. And, um, just uh, before we get to the Q&A, there's another poll question here in terms of uh, changing uh, operational protocols. 
Well, this is interesting. It looks like um, the largest change has been to flushing sewer lines, and that's one of our lead questions that we'll uh, get into in a second here. Um, many have done no changes. Um, others are, mon are modifying their closed circuit television monitoring, uh, lab testing, and uh, some others which are in the chat box. Great, so with questions and answers, uh, we have a whole lot of them came through uh, and thank you all very much for providing them. And we will get to uh, as many as we can here in the next few minutes. The first one to lead off with is one which was um, repeated uh, quite uh, frequently. And that is a concern over uh, the viability of COVID-19 uh, and aerosols, which may be uh, created through power washing, uh, through muffin monsters, through uh, flushing lines, from aeration basins, um, et cetera. Uh, is that a concern for us? Uh, maybe for Amy or Chuck or, or Rasha in particular? And remember to unmute yourselves if you would. So this is Amy, can you guys hear me? Yes, Amy. Great, okay, I got disconnected briefly, wasn't sure if I was still on. Uh, yeah, so the question about survival in aerosols is very common. Um, I would have make a few points. So one, detecting live virus and aerosols in the real world is very difficult. Um, there's a lot of technical limitations that uh, make it hard to determine. We can certainly detect that virus is there, Detecting whether or not it's infectious virus is very challenging. Um, we do have a paper that was published probably about a month ago now um, that's very highly cited that showed that you could detect virus in, air, in lab generated aerosols uh, for three hours. And so that has become quite highly cited, although I would note that those are lab generated aerosols under very um, limited conditions and it's unclear how um, applicable those would be to real life conditions where you would have, you know, if you're out in the um, sun, you would have UV disinfection, you would have air currents, um, temperature variation, all of those things that could impact virus survival and exposure. Uh, the other thing I would uh, remind people is that we don't have any epidemiological evidence of transmission through wastewater aerosols. So there's a question about aerosols in general. Um, produced, for example, from uh, during healthcare procedures. That's a very different um, question than aerosols produced from wastewater. Um, as Chuck said in his talk, it, the data is conflicting and limited on whether or not the virus excreted in stool is infectious. And that's really the key to understanding whether wastewater aerosols are infectious. At the moment, we don't have any data suggesting, any epidemiological data suggesting that that is infectious virus. Um, and the culture-based data is quite limited um, and weighing more heavily on not being able to culture it. So we do not think that aerosols from wastewater pose a significant health risk. Great, thank you. And um, sort of a follow-on to that, which was also an often repeated question is, um, whether or not masks should be worn by wastewater workers, especially those who may come into contact uh, with wastewater prior to treatment? And if, if the answer is yes, should they be in 95 masks? And maybe this is another one for you, Amy. Sure, so our guidance there is to evaluate the um, processes that you are conducting and uh, who is conducting them and the potential for aerosol generation. Um, this is actually a question that's broader than COVID. Um, that is something that should be considered for any sewage exposure um, and aerosol generation. Um, if you decide that respiratory protection is needed for the task, uh, yes, I would uh, recommend that those should be N95. Just to follow up on that, uh at our utility, when we have high exposure tasks, handling specifically untreated wastewater, um, we do 
recommend that we, we actually do N100s along with the face shield to make sure there's no splashes. So Amy had referred to mucous membrane contact, and that's one of the things we often worry about if you're washing down an aerator or cleaning out the, the uh, grid tanks or the screen bars. So uh, you definitely should uh, return to your facility, look at the task, your site, um, and evaluate the risk and uh, recommendations are pretty much at the moment site specific and task specific. Um, Claudio, um, do you want to maybe chime in here a little bit? Yes, uh, thank you, Rasha. This is Claudio Trinidad, and I'm a Government Affairs Senior Director for the Water Environment Federation in Washington, D.C., and I've been coordinating with the committees uh, working on this, the Disinfection Committee in Public Health that uh, Rasha works with and has been a, a tremendous asset to WEF in pulling together the knowledge base that you heard today, uh, as well as the speakers in this uh, um, webinar, the tremendous uh, quality and, and also for their uh, ability to be able to be uh, share all this information with you. The reason Rasha mentioned it is because WEF is at this point looking to bring together potentially a group of folks uh, experts like the speakers here, like others that work with the WHO and OSHA and CDC and EPA to do, uh, to look at a potentially uh, evaluate at the sort of a, a, a national level, what this, uh, what are the basic tasks, um, sort of follow the protocol that OSHA did and, if, and see if there are the, uh, additional recommendations that need to be made to CDC and federal agencies for them to consider. So WEF is thinking that that may be of value we, uh, we're evaluating that right now. That conversation just happened yesterday. Um, so that's one of the things that we are doing to address this issue uh, face on, uh, given the, the, some of the advice that we heard. And uh, in addition, we're looking to bring in some additional webinars with, with more information. Um, please go to WEF.org uh, forward slash coronavirus. We also have a webinar on, on regulatory compliance that dovetails with uh, a lot of the questions I saw happening on the, uh, on the chat. Uh, also, uh, continuity of operations. We have a whole slew of experts from OSHA and, and also CDC and others um, that uh, spoke and EPA spoke on continuity of operations. But uh, we also uh, will coordinate with the California WEA to do something that may be specific to California as well. So this is collaboration and working together. Um, and so we hope to continue that. One note on legislative, uh, federal, uh, there is another potential, another round of stimulus that may come, including infrastructure. So we're working hard to, in collaboration with MAs as well, to provide some, some good numbers to Congress as they look to uh, fund uh, at a higher level the SRF and uh, other pots of money that we have. So there's that. Finally, wipes. You see wipes is also a big deal, all of you, I'm sure. Um, uh, EPA put out a website on that, but WEF has some information on that as well. But EPA's information, also a lot of that comes from uh, NACWA and WEF. So this is, again, collaborative effort uh, across the board. Thank you again for the opportunity, and then this is just a tremendous effort. Thank you. Thank you, Claudio. So this is Greg. Uh, a question, uh, then again, perhaps for Amy, uh, but also Chuck and Rasha, uh, because uh, we... Uh, currently have our recommendations which are consistent with CDC and WHO uh, and based upon uh, expert microbiologists that we spoke with, including Chuck, which do not recommend any additional uh, personal protective equipment than would normally be used at the headworks or in collection systems. So is that advice no longer valid? I think this is where WEF is really going to step up and, and see what the needs for the industry are. Uh, I think the water sector since the 70s has known there are some issues when it comes to bioaerosol exposures at wastewater treatment plant, as everyone's pointed out today. We know wastewater contains pathogens. While I think many of us could potentially agree that this may not be a COVID specific concern, because as you've seen, we've only been able to isolate COVID virus RNA from wastewater so far. Um, I, th I think what is at hand here is a much larger question about worker safety. And so um, hopefully when WEF starts asking the right questions and talking potentially to experts and the, the membership, um, there might be a little bit more guidance on this topic. 
But for now, I think what most of us seem to agree on that uh, for COVID specifically, the risk would be no different than it would be for other wastewater pathogens. Um, Chuck, would you like to comment on this perhaps? Yes, I, I think, um, you, you know, wastewater, in, uh, we've always known, has a large number of pathogens reflecting illnesses in the community. But we really haven't, you know, previous studies and ongoing uh, studies haven't showed really a need for the change in that. I think, though, it would be a good time for a revaluation of that, given the technology we now have to uh, look at the exposure and estimate the risks over time. So I, I, I think... Uh, in, in the future, we'll even have a better idea. But right now, it, it seems that the uh, recommendations are, are, are more than adequate, that we don't uh, have any evidence that they're not, for sure. And, and based on what we know about the risk from other infectious agents, which, by the way, are a lot more resistant and survive a lot better. You know, I mentioned uh, the coronavirus has survived two or three days in wastewater, but other viruses can survive uh, 30 days in wastewater. So this is a very a virus doesn't survive very well in the environment. So, so the risk of actually infection from these agents uh, would be expected to be much, much less. Great. Thank you much. And, and another question um, uh, for all the panelists is, uh, would there be any concern um, of COVID-19 remaining viable after either secondary or tertiary treatment or in class B biosolids? Yeah, yeah, this is Chuck. We, we, we actually, as I mentioned, we did uh, look at the wastewater after it was treated by Bardenfo and that we, we didn't detect any virus we did, uh, of the, the COVID-19. We did detect it in the raw wastewater before it entered the plant, but not exiting the plant. We, that was done just to give us confidence uh, that the COVID-19 we removed based on what we know about treatment processes, it should have been easily removed. Now, we did see the, the COVID-19 in the primary sludge um, detected by molecular methods. Again, let me always point out that we don't know if it was viable or not, but the, the COVID-19, like other coronavirus, would be expected to be very sensitive to any temperature that might be take place in digestion uh, or composting. So I don't really see where that would present a, a significant risk because it, this is not a very uh, environmentally stable uh, a virus. Great, right, thank you. And another one is, um, is ultraviolet light effective as a disinfectant in the water? Um, the UV light would be expected to be active against this Asia. Whether it would be active in water, we don't have any data. But given the, how we design uh, UV light systems in that, uh, it, it should be adequate for, for that, you know. What, what would probably need it is some additional data on that uh, to, to build up our confidence. But I, I don't see where it would be, uh, be able to survive a current UV light treatment system. But, you know, uh, some data would always build our confidence in that. Because the amount of data on UV light for this for coronavirus is very limited, particularly in water. Uh, but the data is being gathered very rapidly for like using UV light to, to uh, disinfect uh, N95 masks and that. So I think the data is coming up very quickly. Maybe somebody has more recent information than I do on COVID-19 and UV light. Now, uh, I'll second uh, Chuck's answer on this. As far as we know, it should be effective. We're um, recommending that utilities always uh, monitor their process, monitor their UVT carefully. Um, as you know, the more organic material you have in your affluent, uh, the more likely it is that you're going to get some interference with your ability to disinfect. But that being said, by the time you're applying um, UV, you've already gone through potentially primary and secondary treatment, depending on your plant design. And uh, we know, based on actually work that uh, Chuck and his group have done, um, that uh, primary and secondary treatment are actually quite effective at at least giving you one log reduction, so 90% removal, potentially higher, potentially lower, but you do get some removal with, with your basic primary and secondary processes. Thank you very much. And um, a question for Eileen. Uh, if a worker were to test positive um, at your treatment plant uh, for COVID-19, how would one decide uh, who else should be quarantined for 14 days?
You might be on mute, Eileen. Do you hear me now, Greg? Yes. Oh, sorry about that. So yeah, we, we created a whole risk assessment and we got to exercise it for the first time last Friday. Fortunately or unfortunately, the person wasn't at the plant. They were in this admin building on the first floor where this building's not highly populated. But we would follow the same thing if it was at the treatment plant. For one, the person would be sent home immediately. And then we would do a whole risk assessment who had been in contact with that employee within at least a six foot range over the you know two weeks previous. And we would direct them to, to go home, self quarantine and get tested. Because even if they're not showing symptoms, they may be asymptomatic and they could be getting other employees sick. And the other part of this whole thing is that even now for someone who's even showing signs of, of the symptoms who have not actually been diagnosed, there's a whole process that goes with regard to cleaning the whole area. We cleaned all the office space of that person or if it's an uh, operator, the control room and then all the break rooms, the lunch room, the bath, anywhere they've gone, every door handle. And we're already doing much more extensive cleaning of door handles and surfaces now with disinfectants. But there's a much stricter protocol if somebody gets diagnosed with coronavirus as far as the cleaning and then also doing survey of everybody who's been in contact with them and interviewing them and then determining should they go home, should they contact a doctor and what's the next steps for them. Thank you. And this is Amy. If I could just chime in real quickly, I agree with everything Eileen said and what they're doing. Um, I would just add that our recommendations for contact tracing, which is essentially what this is, um, is from the date of symptom onset, two days before that. So you can, it's going to be before when they got sick, the two days prior. Anyone that's been in contact with them, as Eileen said, a, a close contact within six feet. Um, you would want to evaluate those people and um, perhaps have them stay home for the 14 days. Amy, thank you for adding that. And I should say, we're following all the guidelines for the Centers for Disease Control. Everything we're doing, we're using the Centers for Disease Control as our guidance. And so we, I should have clarified that, that that's what we do, Amy. So thank you for bringing that up. Great. Thank you. And then um, there was a clarification question, Amy, on one of your slides that... Um, perhaps said that uh, uh, 0 0.1 to 0 0.5 percent bleach uh, concentration uh, could be used for disinfection. And was that um, an accurate statement? There were several yes, questions. that is that. correct. Okay. Yeah, so we want at least 0.5 percent bleach. Um, concentrations lower than that, there's some data that that's not uh, effective, at least not without extensive contact times. Uh, so our recommendation is 0.1% or higher. Okay. Um, I believe the World Health Organization concentration is 0.5, but anywhere 0.1 to 0.5, I, I'm fairly certain the, the literature seems to agree that that should be effective. Now, I, I see some confusion about the concentration of sodium hypochlorite in household bleach. So if you're confused about that, I recommend... Um, maybe looking at some of the standard operating procedure for mixing household bleach. Thank you, Rasha. Um, and then another question is, as the number of confirmed cases increase, um, and therefore perhaps greater concentrations in uh, influent to a wastewater plant, does that pose any greater concern or change any of the recommendations as we move further into the apex? Yeah, this is Chuck Gerber. Right now, we don't have evidence we're dealing with infectious virus, but it's expected the concentrations will increase as the number of people become infected. But current protective gear and recommendations, I think, should be adequate because they're really the concentrations of what we see of other viruses like adenos, norovirus, and rotavirus during the winter times when they're, they're, the numbers increase a thousand fold. So, uh, but we, we believe that uh, we, since we don't see increases in illness rates among uh, uh, wastewater workers in those areas that the, the current recommendations are, are probably more than adequate. Right. Maybe just a reminder that there has been no evidence of wastewater workers developing COVID as a result of wastewater exposure until this point. 
there have been news reports, but they seem to confound um, the fact that people are acquiring COVID at home or through travel. Um, so I, I urge people to really read through these news articles and distinguish where the source of the infection came from. Excellent advice. And, and um, maybe a final question. Uh, and Chuck and, and Amy and Rasha all perhaps uh, could weigh in on this, but could you elaborate one more time on uh, the fact that PCR may detect uh, the RNA, but not necessarily that it is viable and the difference between that, that nuance? Uh, yeah, this is Chuck. What the, the difference is you're detecting the, the uh, basically the nucleic acid genome of the virus, uh, but you're not de determining whether the virus can actually in infect uh, anybody or cells. Um, so that's the real uh, um, golden test if you have it. You have to really show that it can infect laboratory cells or demonstrate in some other way the virus is actually uh, infectious and capable of causing disease. It's also a matter of dose too. You have to have sufficient numbers of virus to have a high probability of in, in infection too. But base, basically, uh, it's going to take a lot more work to determine whether we really have any virus that's actually infectious. Maybe, Amy, you want to add to that? Maybe. I... Uh, no, I think that is spot on. Um, what I would add is just a reminder that there's lots of ways that the virus can be damaged to the point where it won't be infectious, but we could still detect um, by RNA. So those RNA-based tests are just detecting a small fragment of the genome. So we could have damage to the lipid envelope, damage to the protein capsid inside that, damage to the genome in areas other than where we're detecting for PCR. And all of those would have um, implications for infectivity and, and most likely infectious, but it can still be picked up by our RT-PCR assays. Right, I think it's always an important uh, distinction to note. Thank you very much. And I think with that, um, we can um, move perhaps to uh, Wendy or Claudia. Oh, we have one more poll question on availability of supplies. And this is one which has been raised as well. Um, are there any supplies and materials that you've had trouble obtaining uh, during this crisis? Yeah. Well, there we um, uh, Either uh, Wendy or Claudia want to uh, talk about uh, sure. next steps? Yeah, so sure. And Claudia, feel free to jump in here. But um, what I wanted to say, this is Wendy, and I just wanted to say that water professionals have been doing so much to adapt to these new conditions. And the California Water Environment Association is here to support you and as a resource, as is the Water Environment Federation, which Claudia will speak to. So this is the beginning. I know this. there was a lot of information. There were a tremendous number of questions, which we, we completely appreciate. And there's a whole series that CWEA and WEF are going to launch to help us all have the knowledge, have the expertise to address these issues. So I'll let Claudio jump in with specifics. Thank you so much. Wendy, uh, thank you again for all of you to, to participating and uh, asking the right questions. Sometimes we don't have the answers for them, but they provide us with guidance on next steps. We are collecting information about the kinds of uh, uh, supplies that you need and the kind of difficulties that you're running into. We're trying to quantify it to some extent. Um, what is it, you know, put some sort of numbers. So right now, we got a question today from a uh, um, uh, a supplier is saying, you know, what is we think the needs and the gaps and we couldn't come up with a number and we're trying to come up at least with a guesstimate that we can say, hey, our sector needs this because that will also be helpful for our efforts on Capitol Hill. Um, so any kind of information like the results of the, this, uh, the, the poll, the poll that we have here, we'll, uh, we'll like to have those and we're going to be doing the same with other WAs across the country. We are also getting shovel-ready uh, projects like costs for different projects uh, from MAs as well, member associations, so that we can quantify the need in the sector. Uh, because a lot of this really is also infrastructure. If we, you know, the kinds of things we do and having the right things in place does not happen overnight. 
one thing is about uh, being safe and in a, in, a, in a time of emergency. Another is thinking about infrastructure in the long term, and we have to kind of think about both of those things. But in terms of supplies, very much so, any information that we can get um, about, about the, the, what the needs might be will help us uh, quantify that and which help us make sure you have the right ask. So going forward, our, our idea is to try to put, pull together as much of the information that we're getting, just like we did today, and see if we can uh, have uh, 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 the data and the information reviewed. And we are, uh, it's, we'll be working with Amy and her team at CDC and other agencies to, if we have uh, recommendations that we can make that are uh, uh, grounded in good information to see whether CDC can provide more detail uh, in their guidelines. So that's, uh, um, I think, uh, something that we can do and we'll be doing in the, in the next couple of weeks. Also, I would like to let you know that, that we are adding all this information to, to our website and will be already a lot of that is there, um, a lot of information on this as well, on this topic. Um, so please uh, make sure to take advantage of that. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you again for the opportunity for WEF to work with the California WHO. I'd like to just, uh, on behalf of CASA, thank uh, CWEA and WEF and all of our speakers, uh, terrific job. Thank you and, and all the participants who uh, listened in. Thank you so much. And please uh, do, you'll see a survey uh, monkey uh, link on this last slide here. If you could complete that it would be uh, greatly appreciated.